This morning, the word of the Lord came unto me concerning something that is very vital, very important to the next step in our spiritual journey. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews and the chapter 12. I'm sure this is very familiar passage and a chapter to all of you, especially those of you who are from this church and those of you who are watching all our conferences for ages now. It's more than a decade. Now in chapter 12, we have a, this is one of the most beautiful chapters in this entire book of Hebrews. I would like you to look at verse 22. But you are come unto Mount Zion. Or maybe before that, we let's look at verse 19 or 18. But you are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burn with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words which voice they that heard and treated that the word should not be spoken to them any more for they could not endure that which was commanded and if so much as a beast touched the mountain it shall be stoned or thrust through with a spear and so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. So this first portion of the scripture is a reference to what happened in the book of Exodus chapter 19. And it refers to the experience of the whole nation of Israel at the foothill of Mount Sinai. So that's what the first part. Now, verse 22. But you are come unto Mount Zion. So Mount Sinai is in the Old Testament. But you, are, you have not gone there. You, you don't need to go there. But you are come unto Mount Zion. Or, or we can put it like this. You are appointed to come to Mount Zion. Or we can say your destiny is to come to Mount Zion. That's a better way to put your destiny. The end of your journey or your goal, the end result of your life on earth, your Christian life, is Mount Zion, not Mount Sinai. But if you look at uh, the Old Testament scenario, First, there is life in Egypt. And then there is this Mount Sinai experience. But they were not supposed to stay at Mount Sinai forever. Their end goal was to the promised land. That's the end goal. So Mount Sinai was a temporary stop where they had an encounter. They saw the awesome glory of God, which is going to which should have become the norm, the normal in their life. You know, today, with this coronavirus, there is a new buzzword that is spoken everywhere all over the world. The new normal. Have you heard of that? The new normal. So I like to tell you, or I want to propose to you, that this word new normal is not new. It is very, very old. How old? It was founded at Mount Sinai. That encounter was the new normal. Because that new experience was supposed to become a normal experience for their lives. The whole nation of three million people, a minimum number, 
3 million so with their naked eyes the glory of the Lord God of Israel that's number one number two everyone from the young to the old heard with their own naked ears the voice of the Lord God of Israel speaking with them number three every one of the three million people saw the angels of God ascending and camping on the top of Mount Sinai number four all the three million of them saw the saints of God coming down and abiding on the summit of Mount Sinai that's number four five four number five I'm poor in math no number five the entire lot of three million people saw with their own naked eyes the Shekinah glory of God burning on the summit of Mount Sinai and number six the whole lot of the three million people experienced the shaking and the moving of the mountain that demonstrated the awesome power of the glory of God which was still in a nutshell and that whole lot of experience was to become the new normal in their lives from that day onwards till they come finally to to the promised land this was to become the new normal unfortunately they miss all that they ran to prophet Moses and told him we don't want to see God we don't want to hear God it's too scary for us Moses you you go you go and see him you go and talk to him we will be contented mark that word we will be contented with second-hand information you see was that God's best for them no God wanted to talk to them directly but they said no 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 we will go through a mediator you go Moses you do all the homework you do all the fasting we will do the feasting you do the fasting <laughs> we will do the sleeping you do the watching <laughs> that's exactly what happened right yes. you do all that you pay the price we will do the expenditure but we will freely receive all the price that you paid for okay this was the experience and then God came up with another plan all right okay let let me give you another second best the second best was he said I want to dwell in your midst through the tabernacle so that was God's second best and where was the tabernacle right in the midst of the whole camp of Israel but just a little after the tabernacle was set they sin against when they sin against it repels revolted the presence of God and God said I will no more be in your midst if I am in your midst it will destroy you so he told the prophet Moses pull the camp or pull the tabernacle from the midst of them and pitch it outside gone for good now if you look at our lives today are we any better than them no in fact worse right worse because the children of Israel did not have any precedence before them they do not have any role models before them what else we do in fact first Corinthians chapter 10 tells us that all that the children of Israel experience were object lessons for us so that we do not repeat the same mistakes they did but if you look at the list that the Apostle Paul lists us down 
you will find that we are still till today repeating those same mistakes over and over and over again murmuring, gossiping, backbiting, unbelief whatever they did we are still doing it again and again and again Miriam the three leaders that paid a heavy price now please take note of that three leaders except for Aaron and Moses who were married we don't hear that Miriam had a family so either she was married but her family never mentioned or she dedicated her life as a single for whatever price she had paid to serve God to be a prophetess for him and whatever price Aaron paid to be the high priest for God's glory and whatever greater price that the prophet Moses paid all were wasted because they did not enter into the promised land and why? what is the root cause to all the problem? that's our subject today the root cause is just one word obedience that's the root cause and this is the word the Lord told me to bring to you today obedience this is something that we have constantly heard but it is the most difficult thing to practice in our life obedience you know if we cannot obey temporal rules temporal meaning the rules that are related to the earth if we cannot obey the temporal rules you will never want to obey spiritual rules because your heart is will be set when it becomes very adamant and bent on disobeying rules why? why not? you know when you rebel like that now I want to be balanced here to say uh, that the leadership should not also abuse the, the obedient spirit of the flock you can go either extreme on any subject so we want to just stay on the balance part so obedience is of utmost importance why? because it is the cardinal quality in heaven the foundation everything that makes heaven tick of, there are many attributes you know one of the cardinal attribute of great importance is obedience and we find this obedience epitomized in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ he was a very embodiment of obedience the angels in heaven abide with God in obedience they minister to him in obedience and the overcomers now that's us the overcomers can only overcome because of obedience if you don't have obedience you cannot overcome in the days not too far from now we will all have to make one choice to bow down to the living God or to bow down to the image of the beast and please do not think it won't take place in your lifetime don't think the way things are moving so fast now I promise you and I guarantee you it will take place in your lifetime that means that shows how imminent the end times are it's not some, something far away in the future it's now right outside the doorstep 
That's how close we are. And I tell you one thing. The coronavirus, COVID-19, is a judgment of God. However, the powers to be, you now there are two, two kinds of powers to be. One is the God kind. The other is the evil kind. So the evil kind is capitalizing on the situation to put into implementation their future plan for world domination. Now you see all that happening in the world right now. How much the population are controlled. Locked down. Don't go out. Virus flying everywhere. So what do we do? Stay at home. Don't go out. Virus flying everywhere. So one day I asked someone, you know, so virus flying everywhere and you stay at home, doesn't the virus come into your house? How come the virus doesn't come into your house? Don't you keep the windows open? Do you or do you not? Okay. If you do, doesn't the virus know how to come through the window into your house? Is there an invisible barrier that the virus can see with its spiritual eyes? That, okay, this is a person's house, let's not come in. Let's stay outside and wait for our victim to come out. Okay. They say put on a face mask for our own good. All right, we obey. And then they said, okay, when can you take it off? When you are eating. So I asked once a restaurant a question. So when I remove the mask when I'm eating, doesn't the virus come in? <laughs> right? Doesn't the virus, okay, oh, the virus knows. Oh, they are eating, let's stay outside. <laughs> You see how ridiculous the whole thing is? Yes. Yet, then why do they do that? A practice, don't say control, practice towards global domination. This is a practice, a trial that's going on. The powers to be, the anti-powers. It's a dry run for them. Okay, now they have come up with a new thing. The new thing is, Oh, we should eliminate cash, yeah. currency, because you are handling the currency, the virus can stay on on the paper. It stays on on the paper, and then when you share the note to someone else, the virus sticks on on the paper, like the Aladdin on the magic carpet. You know Aladdin on the magic carpet, right? Okay. So just like that, the virus stays on and it flies from this person to the next person. Once, once you touch the note, it jumps on you. So, what's the, how to solve this problem? Let's go cashless. You see? That is another step towards the mark of the beast. No buying, no selling. Let's do everything online. Online. See, that is the ultimate plan of the Antichrist. See, it, it will never come all of a sudden. It's inch by inch. Inch by inch. So that it be so stiltily, so subtle that almost all of us will fall for it. Because we are psycho-conditioned to think this is better. This is better. Right? So, the virus travels on your banknote. Okay, eliminate, eliminate cash. Let's use credit card. Okay? Plastic. Virus doesn't stay on plastic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but that's only for temporary. Then a few months later they'll say, oh, we have just discovered 
that plastic attracts the virus more than the paper. So let's eliminate plastic. You know, presently, many nations in the world are eliminating plastic. They don't use plastics anymore. Credit cards are made of plastic, right? So they'll say, okay, let's save Mother Earth. We must save Mother Earth. Have you noticed there is a great awareness of climate control, climate change today? Where is that going to lead to? Ah, climate pollution, air pollution, plastic, let's get rid of plastics. So when you get rid of plastics, what is the next step? The most convenient. Let's do everything online. Get rid of coins. And when what are they introducing? Bitcoin. Cryptocurrency. Have you heard of all this? Ah, Bitcoin. Cryptocurrency. You don't see them, but they exist in the virtual world. So they are going to go back to the old system of bartering. You use your cryptocurrency, bitcoins, to buy and to sell. So now, so eliminate all this. So again, your identity can be stolen. Right? Identity can be stolen. So what to do? Because if you put a thumbprint, they can take a thumb impression and steal your thumbprint. So what to do? So they came up with a clever plan. All right, we'll do something else. Instead of thumbprint, let's scan the veins in your palm. Science fiction has become reality today. You know, this um, Amazon, Amazon have, uh, have put on trial a machine that you just put your palm above it. The scanner will scan your veins and then register you. you when you enter into the store, you scan your palm. And then when you take out all your goods and you, when you want to leave the store, no need to pay money, no credit card, nothing. Just scan your palm again all your money is deducted. Isn't it wonderful? You see? Very convenient, right? Don't need to carry a thick wallet anymore. All plastic cuts down the drain. Eliminate all of them. Just your one hand is enough. So what happens if someone is amputated? Uh, John, what to do with that? Leg. Good idea. <laughs> you see, where is this leading to? The mark of the beast. Inch by inch by inch is leading towards that. So there will be two options before us to worship the image of the beast or to worship the true living God. And what is the one thing, a one attribute in the center that will make you to yield to this or yield to that? Obedience. To whom will you obey? Will you obey the system of this world? Or will you obey the living God? No matter, even if it causes your life. This is where most Christians are going to fall. When it comes to make a choice between your life, either you live for the devil or you die for God. Which will you choose? If I ask you this question, all of you will put up your hand and say, yes, I will give my life to the Lord. No problem. But what about your babies? If it is between your baby and you, what will you do, Brittany? I mean, the life of your baby or to worship the Antichrist? Which will you choose?
So, or you already prepared. Very good. So you don't mind your baby's been, their head's been dashed against the stone. You don't mind. Huh? I would mind, but... But you don't care. <laughs> you know, I ask my staff this question. In our staff meeting, I'll tell you this story, okay? In our staff meeting, I ask, I ask everyone this question. So they all said, yes, we'll give our life to God. So there was one of my staff who just delivered a new baby. So I asked her, she said, tell me, my dear daughter, if they just squeeze the neck of your newborn baby, how would you feel? Earlier on, she was very bold to answer, you know. But when I presented this picture, she was quiet. And then I said, they squeeze harder. They squeeze harder. And you can, you can hear the scream of your baby. What will you do? Tears started rolling down her eyes. She had no answer, which is the normal reaction of a mother. Normal reaction. But like what Brittany has answered, we must prepare our children to be martyrs for the Lord. You must prepare. It is written in the scriptures that such a scenario that I just painted is not a fiction. It will come to pass in the future because such a scenario had taken place in the past. They, they have taken up little children, babies, and just dash their head against the stone, against the wall. You, you will find this in the book of Second Kings. This has happened in the past, and there is a prophecy in the book of Amos that it will happen again in the future. We are vulnerable at our weakest point. So you want to strengthen even the weakest link in your life and in your family. You must be mentally prepared that death is just temporary. It's just a temporary loss. Eventually, we'll all be united together. It's just a temporary loss. So until and unless you are not mentally strong and prepared in the spirit and in your faith of such things, then when it comes to a choice, we will fall. No matter what happens, you and your spouse and your children must make a decision, like how Joshua made a decision, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will not bow down to any other gods. So obedience is the cardinal factor, even for the overcomers to overcome. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. They love not their lives even unto death. And obedience is an act that is constantly required of men, every man, from the first man, Adam, even to the last man that will remain on this earth of the remnant. So how can we define obedience? The word obey, from the Greek word, it, it defines, it means like this, to hear under as a subordinate means you are a subordinate and you are hearing a person who is higher in authority to you to listen attentively to listen attentively to hit or conform to a command or authority so that's the basic definition of what obedience is. So simply put, obedience is to do 
what you are told to do very simple obedience is to do what you are told to do you know i have a simple formula in my life a simple principle you i will obey the laws of the land as long as it does not contradict the laws of god this is my principle my stand i will obey whatever the laws of the land says either for my good or for the good of my fellow neighbor or for the good of society you obey as long as it does not contradict or contravene the laws of god within that if it wants to make me to disobey the laws of god then i will choose the laws of god and will become in the eyes of god as a defaulter in the eyes of the land as a defaulter so be it so be it an excellent example for this is found in daniel chapter 3 and daniel chapter 6 there's two incidents here one involves the three hebrew youths shadrach meshach and abednego and the other involves just the prophet moses daniel so both of them face a similar situation there was a law made in the land in the first instance they must bow down and worship a huge statue of the likeness of king nebuchadnezzar in the second incident there was a law made in the land that they should not pray to any other gods except the king for a period of 30 days so in both instances these two men or four men found that this laws of the land contravene the laws of god because the laws of god says thou shall not worship any other gods and there it says thou shall not both you know both the same right so what did they choose the penalty was death execution that was the penalty in the first instance they were thrown into a fiery furnace in the second instance they were thrown into a den full of lions hungry lions which probably had been fasting for 40 days <laughs> how do i know they were fasting for 40 days because at the end of the fast they were given food to eat so in both incidences the penalty was death so knowing the penalty of death this four hebrew men chose to obey god at the expense of not loving their lives even unto death in both situation ah listen very important in both situation they prayed ardently that god will save them from being executed were their prayers hurt no their prayers were not hurt they were thrown in both instances they were thrown right they were thrown into the fiery furnace and into the lions den they were thrown so their prayers were not heard their prayers were not answered because their prayer was lord stop me from death protect me from all evil in this case they were protected but not in the manner you wanted it to be answered see their prayers were answered but not in the manner you wanted to be done so therefore the lord jesus said to his disciples purpose in your mind purpose in your heart that you don't defend yourself commit yourself fully into the hands of the living god who alone can protect you whatever way they were thrown into the fiery furnace not the hair on their body were burned 
and the world and the best part of the story is even the smell of fire was not found on them right and in the lion's den story when when the prophet den was thrown down the depth the height of the den was at least 20 to 30 feet deep so he was thrown that from that high and the lions see it says lions so there were more than two right more than two so they were about to pounce on him when the angel of the lord which was sent to protect the prophet daniel stopped the lion say stop your foot is coming next stop for now <laughs> If you obey, so the angel told the lions, if you obey my word, instead of one man, I will give you ten people. So the lions sit, they sat down and they had a discussion among themselves. So they gathered a committee, you know, their committee. Like, Come on, let's have a board meeting. So they, they sat down and, and they talk, you know. Okay, if, if this one guy, now there are six of us here. And we need to share this one person. But this angel is saying he's going to give us 10. So that's at least about each one of us will have one whole piece of the turkey. <laughs> Instead of just a small slice. So which is better? Let's go for that. So let's continue our fast for one more day. <laughs> let's just wait for one more day. We have waited for 40 days. What about uh, just one more day? So they told the, uh, the angel, All right, sir, we have discussed, and the board has passed a resolution. <laughs> we have resolved to obey you. So the angel told the lion, Wise choice. I'm going to send you big, juicy, juicy, juicy guys. And you know the end of the story, right? You know what is the best part of the story? Those, those evil men who plotted against the prophet Daniel, their families, not only them, their entire family, their wives and their children, were all thrown into the den. Before they reached the ground, the lions tore them apart to pieces. So by then you'll know how hungry they were. They tore, tore them apart to pieces. See, in the midst of a tragedy, God holds you in his hand. You may be thrown into the lion's den or into the fiery furnace, but God holds you in his hand. There are historical records that say the apostle John was thrown into a boiling pot of oil and he came out of it unscathed nothing touched him the boiling oil you know not just boiling water boiling oil that would have fried him he came out of it of course even in the first century there were some saints who were burned at the stake so that was their call they are called to be a martyr but here the Apostle John should be preserved till the end. So as such, the Lord supernaturally protected him. So how does all this happen? Because of one word, obedience. So purpose in your heart today. And obedience is also unquestioning. You don't question when God tells you something. And that was the attitude of the prophet Abraham. He had implicit obedience. Implicit obedience means unconditional surrender. You surrender to the Lord unconditionally. Whatever your will, it is my command, Lord. Unconditionally. Which means you are willing to drop everything because you want to obey. If you say that someone has an implicit faith or belief 
in something you mean that they have complete faith in God without doubting anything you don't doubt and a good example for this can be found in Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 and 4 and 5 where Abraham was asked to leave his father's house and go to a place where it will be shown to him now this thing is quite difficult for a western mind to grasp because in the western to the west in the western culture when you're 18 you move out of your parents house you built your own nest but in the eastern society we don't leave the father's house even when we are married we stay in an extended family so grandfather father mother children grandchildren everybody they all stay together like one big happy chicken coop <laughs> it is offensive for the children to move out offense except for the girls you know they are they get married they move to their husband's family but the sons they all stay together with their parents so no moving out so this is the culture of Abraham so in that culture now God tells him leave your father's house so that is a big price to pay furthermore staying together you have you don't have many overheads because the father pays all the rent you just stay free of course you don't stay free you help out with all the household costs because they always do family business together it took great faith and Abraham was not single he was a married man and he had his fair share of little wealth in terms of flocks so to take everything with him he needs roof over his head but now God tells him go go where go just go go where Lord just go just go for example it's like this you know now you are in the west and God, God tells you go east where is Lord just go so you get into the Greyhound is there a bus Greyhound going from California all the way to New York there is okay I once got on the Greyhound you know and I traveled from Seattle all the way to Des Moines Iowa four days journey I enjoyed it because in those my younger days I had the luxury of time but not today you know so you drop you get on the Greyhound sit on the Greyhound and the bus goes all the way to the east but where in the east where in the east will be told you when you reach the east it will not be told to you right now it will be told you when you reach your destination that is obedience implicit obedience now you need you need all this to survive in the last days if you do not practice right now this is these days are called peace time if you do not practice your faith in peace times you will fall during the regime of the Antichrist and please do not think you can suddenly boost up your faith during those times it will not happen like that it will not happen so during the good days store up your faith grow in faith build up your inner man while there is still time while there is still time obedience is doing what is commanded of you a good example of this is found in Genesis chapter 22 verses 1 to 14 when the Lord God asked Abraham to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice 
Now there is no chance for Sarah to conceive again. No more chance. Isaac is the only son. And now God tells him, offer your only son. Now if you read the passage, it's, you can see how God stirs up Abraham's emotions. The son whom you love so much. He, he just stirs up his emotions to allow Abraham to see his own heart, whether he loved God more than his own son. He just stirred him up. That is why sometimes some negative circumstances happen in your life. That is God is stirring, stirring the situation to make you see what is important inside you. What is important? Is there any idols in your heart? What are you holding dear to? At the end of the day, with all the blessings you already have, will you still obey God at the drop of a head? Or now your heart has changed? So negative circumstances, negative situations are there to help us. To know what is in our heart. You can't see your own heart, right? You can see. So how are you going to know how high is your faith or how low is it if you are not put in a situation? How are you going to know? When you are in a situation, what will you do? It shows the degree of your faith. If you don't take any moment to decide what, yes or no, it shows how high your faith is. But if you're going to swing like a seesaw, to obey or not to obey, to obey or not to obey, then it shows how low your faith is. This shows you. God is showing you where you stand. And then you want to remedy that. When you remedy that, then you'll put into test number two. So test number two, again another opportunity given to see whether have you remedied. Okay, now from 30 fold you have come to 60 fold. Is it good? No, no. 60 fold is not good enough because there's 40% chance for you to fail. Right? So you cannot check, take the 40% chance. So another test, another test for you to overcome the remaining 40%. So when you've overcome the 40%, then comes test number three. See how good heaven is? <laughs> See? They design all this to make sure you pass from grade one to grade two to grade three. So when it comes to test number three, if at the drop of the hat, you pass the test, then you have reached the hundredth percentage mark. Pass. Good. No more test number four. No need. And test number four is real life situation. Real situation. So, obedience to all that God tells you to do. Be obedient. We read this in Exodus chapter 24 verse 7, where the uh, prophet Moses was told by God, all those things that were shown to you on the mount, concerning the making of the tabernacle, do according to how you are told to do. Nothing more, nothing less. Now disobedience is very, very costly. Very costly. An excellent example of that is found in 1 Kings chapter 13, verses 1 to 28. There you'll read about an unnamed prophet. His, his name is not mentioned at all. So the Lord told him to go to a certain city, give a word to the king, and then come back home. He was not supposed to lodge the night anywhere. He was not supposed to eat anywhere. He was not supposed to drink a cup of water anywhere, but just come back home. So he delivered the word of the Lord and he packed his bag, saddled his donkey, and was heading home. And the older 
prophet in the town heard about this man's wonderful ministry he decided how can we let a man of god leave town without feeding him a meal so he hurried back met the man of god he said oh man of god i heard about your wonderful prophecy to our king you must come to our house for a meal so this younger prophet tells the older prophet no 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 the lord told me not to eat and the older prophet said yes you are right but the lord also told me to honor his servant oh the lord told you and this younger man looked up at the older man so he said okay he is of a higher caliber probably the lord must have given him an updated 2.0 version of the prophecy so he went to this older prophet's house and the older prophet's wife had cooked sumptuous meal from one end of the dining table to the other end of the dining table was full of food so he said to eat and he saw his favorite dish there popeye's drumstick <laughs> so he took the popeye's drumstick and he was about to sing the song of popeye you know popeye the sailor man pop pop <laughs> see don't forget your humble beginnings <laughs> see they don't show this old good old cartoons anymore no it's okay too bad so he took the drumstick as he was about to huh, came the word of the lord to the older prophet you disobedient prophet because you disobeyed you shall die so this his mouth was wide open to bite like a shark and now, now he was shivering hearing this new prophecy so he dropped the drumstick saddled his donkey and he started going going back in the middle of the night just before he left the boundary of that town a lion came from nowhere kill see lion always attacks an animal right but this lion was commanded by god and was specifically told kill the man but not the lion i mean not the donkey and the lion lion was extremely obedient implicit obedience so with one blow it killed the prophet he dropped dead and the most beautiful part of this whole scenario is the one that i like the most is the lion sat down beside this dead body and the donkey sat beside the lion and they all spent through the whole night watching unto prayer in the morning news went far and wide through the whole town that the prophet who delivered the word is dead so the older prophet came looking for this younger prophet and everyone in town saw the lion just very calmly seated beside the dead body it did not eat the dead body because god told the lion to only kill him not to eat him the price of disobedience price of disobedience today you may not be struck by a lion but the consequences of disobedience you face in different ways the end result will still be death may not be physical death but in other form so learn to please god in all ways because pleasing god is obedience john chapter 8 verse 29 the lord jesus christ always did everything in obedience to god and that is why we read in matthew chapter 3 verse 16 to 17 that the lord god at the baptism during the baptism of the lord jesus christ said of him this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased 
Why did the Father God say like that? Because we read in Luke chapter 2 verse 51 that the Lord Jesus Christ from, from his babyhood to 30 years old was very obedient to his parents. And John chapter 8 verse 46 tells us he lived a clean, pure and holy life. He was always obedient. And Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8 tells us why, how did the Lord Jesus learn obedience? Through the things he suffered. So how can we learn obedience? Suffering by the things that he suffered sufferings so when suffering comes don't look at it negatively that is a tool to sharpen sharpen us so embrace all this in good faith you know this kind of teachings are totally foreign to the charismatic Christianity. What else? In the Catholic tradition, if you have read some of the lives of some of those early church fathers, some of those monastic monks, this is very practical in their lives. They just embrace suffering. Like, have you heard of this man of God called Francis of Assisi? One of the remarkable saints that made a deep impression on me about the how to learn a life of suffering and obedience. Every day he will look, he will say to himself, Brother, trouble, come. He calls them brother, sister. Brother, suffering, come. I embrace you with all my heart. And he was born in a very wealthy family and and he lived a flamboyant playboy lifestyle that was how he lived and then there came a time when he had an encounter with god he was born again and instantly from a flamboyant playboy lifestyle he turned 180 degrees and he totally abandoned the lifestyle renounced all his faith i mean renounced all his wealth and put on the rope of a monk and join a monastery. Until the day he died, that was the life that he lived. And it was later end of his life, the five wounds of the Lord Jesus were found in his body. And he always had face-to-face -face encounters with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he had a powerful healing ministry. And he lived that like kind of a life. So when you, em when you embrace this, they sharpen you, they polish you. But charismatic Christianity has taught us over the last 30 years that if you embrace such things, you have no faith. Have you heard that? That's what charismatic Christianity teach. All those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution so persecution is part of the christian life with much tribulation we shall enter into the kingdom of heaven acts chapter 14 verse 22 and all our forefathers the new testament leaders they all walked through that path the captain of our salvation walked through that path can we have anything lesser no, that is the path you want to walk through because it perfects us. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 19 tells us there must be a willing heart to obey. You can obey unwillingly, but you must obey willingly to receive the reward. You must obey willingly. Even in giving of offerings, the Lord told the Israelites in Exodus chapter 25 verse 2, take an offering from all those who will give willingly. 
willingly. So you don't give grudgingly. When you give grudgingly, that's what you get in return, grudgingness. You will not get good measure, pressed down, shaken over. You won't get that blessing because you gave out of a unwilling, ungrateful, grudging heart. When you are called to do a work, what should we do? Number one, accept, accept it with a willing heart in true humility and submission. Just like how the Virgin Mary behaved. She said, here am I, Lord. Let it be unto me according to your will. Luke chapter 1 verses 26 to 28. Number two, seek diligently to find the assignment given to you. What is it that is required out of you? What is God requiring you? He's calling you to do something. So the next question is, so Lord, what do you want me to do? Number three, having a certain God's will and purpose. The work needs to be done in love, humility, and with a willing heart. Not in competition. You can compete to be the best. I want to do better than my neighbor. But you don't want to compete with out of envy. You can compete to be the best. But do not compete out of jealousy or envy because that will be disastrous. Number four, serve God with a willing heart. First Chronicles chapter 28 verse 9. So in conclusion, the word of the Lord came unto me to give you this. The saints fell. And who are they? In Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 we read about the sons of God falling. So the saints fell. The angels fell. In Jude verse 6 we read the angels who kept not their first estate but they strayed away from their place of calling and they fell. So the saints fell the angels fell and believers will fall. Why? Disobedience. One factor. They, every one of them fell because of disobedience. My dearly beloved brothers and sisters, obedience is going to be your ultimate test. Your ultimate test in the days to come, in these days. In these last days. Your ultimate test. And the Lord Jesus Christ overcame. Because of obedience. Now while the worship was going on. I received a word from the Lord. To give you one additional information. About this subject. Please turn with me. To Revelation chapter 14. Earlier on, we read about Hebrews chapter 12, about going to Mount Zion. Now, that is our destiny, going towards Mount Zion. Your life in this world is a preparation to go there. So, to go there, or when you reach there, what is required out of us? Or what is the cardinal requirement to be there? So let's read from verse 1 onwards. Revelation chapter 14. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of the harpers harping with their harps, and they sang as it were a new song before the throne 
and before the four living creatures and the elders and no man could learn the song but the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth these are they who were not defiled with women for they are virgins these are they who follow the lamb wherever he goes these were redeemed from among men the first fruits unto God and to the lamb and in their mouth was found no guile for they are without fault before the throne of God so the word of the Lord that came unto me said tell them they should stand on Mount Zion that is their call that is their destiny and to stand on Mount Zion the Lord showed me look at them look at the 144,000 what qualified them to stand on Mount Zion now if you look at verse 4 the one cardinal qualification the uppermost supermost one is these are they who follow the lamb wherever he goes so to follow the lamb wherever he goes you need what obedience obedience this is the word to follow the lamb wherever he goes which means you just follow the Lord's footsteps you don't move to the right you don't move to the left which means you don't you should not have your own opinions your opinion is the word of God your opinion is the commandment of God you don't have your own opinion to interpret it otherwise you don't you follow the lamb wherever he goes even if it means to fall into the ditch just follow the lamb if you fall down he will uphold you by the right arm of his righteousness Amen. Amen. you must have that faith that he will hold you up follow the lamb wherever he goes Amen. So I leave this word with you to practice throughout this year, the remaining months of this year, two and a half months. You want to learn obedience. Amen. And uh, let me reiterate the purpose of my coming to Lancaster this year. The Lord told me to go and to give a message to this nation concerning the election of the president. And that's why I'm here. That please pray very much for President Trump. And don't vote for the wrong man. So that is your cardinal duty from today until November 3 then don't stop there i just remembered one thing yesterday you know last night as i sat in my room i was pondering over that between november 3 and january 20 anything can happen to overturn right right am i right anything can happen to overturn so you want to don't stop praying till november 3 you want to continue till Mr. Trump is safely installed, inaugurated on January 20th. Amen. Amen. Don't wait. I tell you one truth. See, I do not know anything about American politics. I don't need to know. I'm telling you the word from heaven. I reveal to you God's mind and God's purpose for this great nation. That's all I know. I don't need to know the red and the blue. Who is greater, who is lesser, who is right, who is wrong, whose mouth is big, whose mouth is lesser. That's not my business, you know. And I'm the first person to admit I do not know anything about American politics. But I know one thing. What is written in the scroll in heaven about the destiny of the U.S.? 
and in that destiny god's will is mr trump should be should serve another term because god is extending his grace for this nation one more time for another four years there is another work that god wants to do in this great nation and that can only be done through a man with a personality like mr trump you need a ruffian like him you know i'm sorry but that's what he is right a ruffian even like a gangster right <laughs> Oh, a, so I use the right word. Ah, yeah. uh, street fighter. So gangster, right? Yeah. Ah, good. <laughs> you know, a person with that kind of personality, I don't think you would have ever seen in the history of your 45 presidents a man like him who is willing to take on anybody. <laughs> even the mighty united nations right have you seen any other presidents of even china could not do that but your man mr trump he took on come on i mean what a fearless man against all odds he's standing alone yeah. right he's standing alone you know on the 5th of october which i shared last night when the lord came to me at 2 30 in the morning and spoke to me about mr trump he showed me his heart how much he's bleeding inside because he's standing all alone Practically everyone is hitting him left and right. He's been battered, he's been butchered, he's bleeding, he's crying. Of course, externally, in public, he's putting on a big front. But I saw him in the secret of his big chamber, crying unto God. He was crying and saying, Lord, I'm all alone. I'm standing all alone. I heard him pray like that. Please help me, Lord. So the Christians, even in the last many months, a large percentage of Christians in this nation have also turned against him. That's the bad part. The bad part. But, Prayer can move mountains. Amen. 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 Prayer can move mountains. And the Lord showed me three powerful angels have been stationed to be to guard him all the time. Powerful angels, mighty angels. They are standing with him all the time. And I forgot to mention a vision that I saw on the first night. While I was getting dressed to come to the meeting, I saw a vision of an eagle which I knew symbolized the United States and that eagle looked at me and was crying for help it was crying for help so a wrong man should not become your president if the wrong man becomes your president your nation will go down and it will not rise up again that will be the end of the United States of America. Because God is not finished with America yet. The promises, the covenant that he had made with your forefathers, from the day they had consecrated and dedicated this land to the living God, God had made some covenants with them. And that those covenants and the promises will reach its zenith in the next term. So you want to be a righteous man in the office who will open greater doors of freedom 
for the gospel of the kingdom of God to go the length and the breadth from the east coast to the west coast. Do you know right now, instead of wonderful men and women of God rising up from the US, it is they are rising up from Africa, they are rising up from the east. And God is sending them to the US to tell you how to walk right. From the south. What is on the south? South America. Ah. Of justice and righteousness from South America, Central America, coming to America. Okay, so it is south, from the South America, from Africa, from the East. Now they are coming and telling you how to live right. Where else, 100 years ago, you had gone there and, tell, and told them how to live right. How to turn away from idols to worship the true living God. The idols that we gave up, you have embraced them. See how much you are sunk under. But if you are obedient and Mr. Trump is voted again, this one thing will be restored. Amen. And like, like the slogan that Mr. Trump says, let's make America great again. Amen. I don't think that came from his own mouth, you know. It's God who put those words in his mouth. And America will be made great again. Not only in the natural, but also in the spiritual. And once again, like the Statue of Liberty holding up the torch in her hand, high up for all to see. The body of Christ in the U.S. will hold the torch of God. High up. One more time. One more time. So you don't want to miss this one more time. Amen? Amen. Let's arise for a word of prayer. <clears throat> then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great art thou, how great art thou, then sings my soul, my Savior God to Holy Father, I have communicated to your children all the words that you have shown me and you have put in my mouth concerning the destiny of this nation and also concerning the destiny of your servant, Mr. Donald Trump. And we thank you, Lord, for you have chosen him to lead this nation in righteousness to restore righteousness back to this nation. Just like King Cyrus, whom you chose to restore Jerusalem back to its old glory and to restore the temple in Jerusalem back. Likewise, you have chosen Mr. Donald Trump to restore this nation to turn this nation back to righteousness, back to holiness, and make the body of Christ in the United States great again. Thank you, Father. Now we, your people, lift up our hands unto you. And we pray, let your will be done in this nation. And we pray, let your chosen men be voted to office on the day of the election 
and not only voted to office but in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we your people unitedly pray and push back every enemy forces that will corrupt the voting system that will manipulate the world voting system and we pray that the corrupt officials will be pushed back every demonic evil prince angels that come from the south assigned to disrupt cause confusion cause disharmony against this nation be bounded and we lift up our hands unto the king of glory and we pray that a group of warrior angels would be dispatched just like the angel we read in Daniel chapter 10 that came down who stood with King Darius the same manner we thank you Lord for your mighty angels that you have stationed around Mr. Trump and we pray wherever he goes for the election campaigns he will be protected from all evil that you will be protected from the bullets yes. from any kind of assignment against his life yes. we pray that the angel of the Lord will encamp round about him yes. and the blood of the Lamb of God will be all over him yes. and the shadow of the Most High God will overshadow him yes. and protect him and preserve him from all evil yes. And we also pray for his family yes, Lord. that the enemy will not bring a wedge yes, between him and his wife yes, that will become a news of scorn, yes, a news of insult. Yes, Father, we pray, Lord, your will be done. Yes, Wipe away the tears of your servant, Mr. Trump, Lord. Yes, Heal his broken heart, Lord. Yes, Lord. And we pray now that every godly Christian in this nation yes, who hears your word, whose hearts are attuned to your stirrings, that they will all raise up a holy cry unto you. Yes, From this day, till January the 20th, 2021. Thank you, wonderful Father. We also pray that the motorcade of Mr. Trump will be protected. Yes. That the helicopter yes. that he takes will be protected. Yes. That the Air Force One plane will be protected. Yes. We plead the blood of the Lord Jesus yes. for all this transport. Yes land transport and air transport yes, and we also pray against every sniper yes, that will that may be assigned to even assassinate yes, to kill and to destroy yes, even when the president is in the White House yes, 